to uh, Java Bean Online. This is the seventh meetup uh, we have in Java Bean. And uh, very happy to see everyone uh, with us tonight. T uh, today we have uh, Gupal Akshinatal with us. He will speak about functional programming. Uh, I hope I pronounced the name correctly. Uh, we have, we have uh, a lot of uh, interesting stuff going on. Uh, this is the seventh online meetup we are doing. Tomorrow we will have another meetup uh, in a joint event with the Oracle. Uh, that will be about uh, JDK 11 and uh, module systems. So tomorrow we will start 3 p.m. Central Eastern time. So join us then. Um, my name is Darish. If there is any questions about uh, Java Bean, uh, if you want to speak uh, in our events, please just contact us through Twitter or, and uh, we will get in touch with you. If you have any questions uh, during today's uh, session, please use the comments field and we will make sure to bring the questions to Gupal in the end and we'll get them answered. So, uh, Gupal, here you go. Hey, thanks, Tervis. Hi, everyone. And yeah, I'm going to just share my screen. Uh, so you're seeing my screen, right? Let me know once it's on. Okay. Uh, I hope the screen is on. Dervis uh, can kind of just yeah, he's on. do a oh, yeah. great. Awesome, awesome, yeah. great. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, I know I have a simple first name, but a complicated last name. It's I'm Gopal Akshintala. Uh, and I am from India. It's kind of 9.30 here, an exciting time to give a tech talk. So let's talk about uh, functional programming today, especially fighting complexity with functional programming. And that is my Twitter handle and my website uh, where I talk about uh, stuff more about functional programming. And you can find an entire blog post about this talk as well there. So moving on, uh, I would start with this statement, this kind of a pretty popular statement about FP, especially uh, told by managers and tech leads saying FP is cool cause it's complex enough to make devs feel like they're doing something smart. So uh, I was told that I was also in pursuit of FP for the same reason, but today we're not gonna learn FP just because it's complex. Uh, uh, and it's not complex. We're going to prove that it's going to fight complexity. And FP is not just a cool a tool, but then there is a lot of depth in FP, which is going to help us write production ready code with a lot less cognitive complexity. And let's begin uh, our uh, talk with this uh, with the slide wherein I'm going to today, whatever I'm going to uh, talk uh, is totally based on a true story that happened in our team within Salesforce and all the code that I'm gonna to show today is actually running in production. Of course, I can't show you the production code. So I have prepared some dummy code, which kind of emulates exactly the same design. But uh, we're gonna discuss going through all those design decisions and uh, brain wars that we, we had while we designed that particular real world problem, uh, which is REST validation framework that we're gonna jump in. But for that, let's start our talk with something very serious, like all those developer holy wars that we keep having on our day-to-day -day basis. The first one in my list is IDE light versus dark theme. So this is a kind of war that has been growing in the recent years. And uh, I, I know a lot of uh, devs lo love dark theme, but I'm kind of a light theme guy and I'm gonna use a light theme. So it's a disclaimer. If you kind of have a problem, put your goggles on and then uh, Eclipse versus IntelliJ, this is a very big fight. Uh, we keep having, where, whichever company I work for, we keep having this fight. People who use Eclipse say, uh, and a kind of uh, say that's great. And people who use uh, IntelliJ, I kind of uh, straight away reject Eclipse whenever they see it. But Eclipse is great, Eclipse is free, etc. I'm gonna use IntelliJ for the stock. Why am I saying all this? How about this? Have you ever had this war in your team or have you ever seen such a war within a group, your local group or meetup or whatever? A bit because this is a question or a war which never gets old. 
uh, it kind of whenever i see this on a blog post or somewhere i kind of immediately get attracted to it because i want to know because i have been searching ever since i started learning fp and till now i could not find a difference why what is the difference between oops and fp and there probably is a reason for that uh, why we can't draw a line between oops and fp how can we define a paradigm a paradigm can be defined by probably a set of principles that the paradigm uh, kind of uh, is uh, that are predominant in that paradigm let's say oop has all those solid principles defined by uncle bob uh, when it comes to fp uh, the more the principles that you keep listening are immutability referential transparency and side effects uh, at the boundaries etc i don't see any reason why they can't be used together see uh, if you see all these principles that fp preach are more into uh, imbibing discipline into coding so when you say immutability should not mutate the state so you can go on but today unfortunately we don't have enough time to go through all those principles plus most of them can be found on books or blog posts or the nf material out there to understand so i thought how can i spend this one hour to not get into those bookish definitions but add some value to uh, the viewers so i thought let me use this one hour to uh, explain how fp can make a developer productive as well as let's solve a real world problem so that and this problem is not specific uh, or niche it's pretty ubiquitous when it comes to uh, designing back end services which is kind of rest validation so i hope a lot of you can relate that problem to you whatever that you do in your companies and kind of can go and implement a different or tweak this tweak this version or fork this version of what are we going to uh, discuss today so if you have kind of ex experimented with java it features like optional streams etc you should be perfectly able to follow this talk uh, because i don't really uh, go advanced until the end towards the end like we kind of have some advanced concepts i would say advanced it, but it depends on uh, where you are in the fp journey it can can be intermediate or advanced topics so i would be kind of uh, skimming through them because uh, within the limited amount of time i would like to cover as many things as possible within the context of the problem so i would leave you out with a lot of pointers i would use this phrase a lot of times like please go back and refer the reason being uh, uh, we can't of course teach a lot of things within a limited one hour time so uh, i'm going to leave you out with places where you can go and expand whatever you have learned uh, in this one hour but then you can always uh, ping me or uh, a comment in this a uh, meetup group for more clarification i would be happy to give it so that's it there is another war that we didn't talk about that's the imperative versus declarative war which is predominant in java and especially that guy in the middle is a java developer that was probably me also uh, in around 2015 and 16 when java 8 came out i was kind of skeptical uh, like should i go with the declarative style or the imperative style and even now i don't see a lot of adoption in J using java it streams because people are kind of used to that imperative style of coding for years but let's help this java guy java developer to kind of choose between what is what uh, and make him understand what is what so when it comes to imperative it's like this like imagine you have a lot of lego pieces and then you have an instruction set to fit how to fit those pieces together to bring up a shape right so imperative coding is like this wherein you hand over those pieces and the instructions set separately to a computer so that your computer can map those instructions like do this do that do this and then bring up a, a kind of a class file or binary and then execute that <clears throat> but let's see that with an example so let's do some team building activity i know we're all quarantine so we need some kind of a boost to build ourselves so let's try to concatenate all the last names in a team with a delimiter i hope a problem statement is clear all we are trying to get is a string like this with all the last names of a team so this problem is given to our java java developer that we have seen and then this guy comes up with this code okay so uh, he kind of uh, does all this where he takes in a string builder and then loops through all the names extracts the last name based on the white space character here uh, again if a uh, few like me who feel stressful to uh, kind of see code on a big screen you can always go back and refer this recording or i'm going to share the slide deck as well as all this code links so just sit back and relax um, just don't focus on the details just focus on uh, the what part not the how part so this kind of it is it that the guy comes in and 
uh, checks this code for review and the senior developer comes in and says, did you even test? What about the corner cases? See, when you're dealing with white spaces, strings, and especially in Java, there's always this null pointer lurking somewhere as well as uh, there can be empty names, names with more than one space, names with having white spaces in the end, all blah, 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 a lot of corner cases, right? Then, then this guy goes back, thinks about it, and then comes up with this patch, wherein he kind of checks for team is not equal to null, and then he goes with uh, every null checking every team member, and then he trims all the white spaces, blah, blah, blah. And then uh, he again submits that for review. So the senior developer screams again, man, did you even test it? Obviously he must not have written unit tests for this. Otherwise he would have caught this bug where and he is getting a delimiter the last. So he got to have to not have it. So he have to skip it some way. So again, this guy kind of debugs it and comes up with another patch. And so the code turns out to be like this. And he is skipping a, he is checking what is the first uh, string and then skipping the delimiter. So in the end, it kind of works, of course, but then uh, it kind of ends up ends up looking like this agile, a uh, popular agile horse at the right side. So I would say something like this is a patched art. So and like any form of art or writing, things lose their meaning as you keep patching them. Um, but the, it's not the problem of this Java guy because he is not left with any choice but to patch because the very style he has chosen doesn't let him to do anything else, the imperative style. Okay, so imagine this guy kind of uh, is born in a parallel universe as a declarative programmer. What does he do? He would start the problem uh, with this particular style on the right side. So we're gonna see how, comparatively how both of them evolve. So now they're both in the same stage as he submitted for the first time. And then once he understands about those corner cases, he can extend his code by just adding few more expressions in between. So as you can see, he almost got a four is to one compression of, of his code lines. And then everything that he has written actually speaks, speaks out what it's doing rather than uh, getting lost in all the unnecessary uh, imperative details. So this is a declarative style. So let's see how this imperative code is being converted to declarative step by step. So the null check can be totally replaced with stream dot off nullable. Uh, are we gonna jump into code how this actually works within? But for now, just uh, kind of understand. And then uh, all this uh, filtering, all this checking just can be made with this filter map filter. I would request you to go uh, if you are not aware of the, about these filters and maps. I request you to go back and refer the Java API. It's pretty clear and there are a lot of examples out there. And then all this uh, unnecessary detailing is just replaced by these two beautiful expressions wherein you kind of are mapping uh, the extra last name and as well as joining the strings. As simple as that. So this is imperative coding. We have seen what it is. Now declarative coding is this wherein you already have the mental model on the canvas of your IDE, and then you're giving it to the computer. Of course, uh, both these styles, it doesn't matter for the computer. Computer can run any of them. But then for a developer who is reviewing your code or trying to understand it, it, it makes a lot, uh, a lot of difference because it makes his life easy while he can make a mental model directly out of the canvas rather than trying to spend some time kind of debugging or putting some log statements, etc. That's the power of declarative style. But you know, Java, Java has been there. It's the lion king of languages, no doubt about it. It has been there uh, ever since most of us even started going to schools. Uh, and even now, even today, we are using that in production, it's not a joke. But then why Java is just introducing this uh, functional concepts very recently, and then it's kind of taking a very defensive mode and trying to push functional features while other modern languages like Kotlin, Scala are just running with these features and all of them just now uh, in these recent times, not previously. So is it just about the style? Is it just about the imperative versus declarative or there is something hidden in between? Let's try to find that out by giving a wrinkle to our problem. How to concatenate last names in parallel. So let's try to do this code. Let's try to make it parallel, work in parallel. You know, it kind of, it gets really scary to do that. But I kind of had few implementations which I'm gonna share in the code, uh, which I'm gonna give you at the last. 
I, I used folk join pools and thread pools, and uh, you can imagine how the code can turn into, you know, it's already lost in all these details. Now, the moment I add all the thread orchestration, totally it becomes an alien. I, you, can, you can't relate what's going on in there. Uh, see, uh, but you know, the problem is there are two things. The how to do's and what to do's in a particular problem. And looping through the list, aggregating results is how to do's and validating the names, extracting last names for what to do's. The problem is an imperative. We have mixed all four. And that's the reason now, now that one of our how to do's, which is looping through and aggregating has to turn into parallel, we had to totally rewrite our code, which kind of ends up being unrecognizable. So how can we do this in declarative style? You know, I, I, I hope, you know, it's coming, right? It streams to parallel streams, but this is not what I'm trying to sell you, not the parallel streams. I'm trying to sell you this concept, the core context philosophy. Uh, you don't have to label it to FP, but then this is pretty predominant in any software paradigm wherein you got to write to abstractions. The reason why we, uh, we had just, we could just do this simple switch and get away with the parallel implementation as we kind of wrote to stream. We all, all this are working underneath a stream. So the moment I switch the context to parallel stream, all my core code is not changed, but kind of suddenly works in a parallel way. So that's the core context philosophy. You do things differently without doing different things. That's that's the that's the beauty of FP, wherein it kind of gives you a lot of operations, which underneath uh, handles all the complexity for you. But then at the top, you can kind of write some beautiful code, which is more readable. You're going to see more such examples going forward. But for now, we're almost halfway through a tech talk, and I kind of have an internal bang for you guys. The stream that we have been using till now is the Monad. Now, I hope uh, most of you have heard about this term Monad, but uh, I don't know how many of you dared enough to actually go into and understand what it is, because I know it's pretty scary to even hear the term. Uh, yeah, there's even a guy uh, called Douglas Crockford uh, who, who made a popular joke, like if you understand Monads, you kind of lose the ability to explain them to others. That's kind of the Monad curse. But then I'm gonna try to break that curse today. By the way, that was me on the right side trying to understand uh, Monads in my initial days, going through a lot of blog posts and uh, all those Haskell related stuff. And uh, this is how I felt. I, I did not understand a thing about it. Uh, until I kind of kept, I kept doing it and then I found some resources which were more clear. Developers like me who tried the same and kind of kind enough to write blog posts, especially I would recommend a blog post like this uh, if you are into Kotlin. Java doesn't have this uh, particular uh, blog post, but then you can relate things uh, exactly because Kotlin is similar to Java. So there are different things called functors, monads, applicatives. Uh, today's talk, we're not gonna get into them. I'm gonna just refer to all of them as monads. And let's see how difficult or simple they are. If you ask me what is a monad, monad is just a pattern, a design pattern, just like any other design pattern that we have in Java. And uh, it just kind of abstracts away certain things, uh, just like any other abstractions that we kind of write with the design patterns. Let's see, let's start our journey with a very simple monad uh, called uh, maybe monad. Okay, if you have ever used optional in Java, it's a maybe monad, as simple as that. So, but what makes it a monad? Uh, it has two states, okay? Two states, imagine uh, these two states and these two boxes wherein at one state you have a value, something in the box, and the red state on the right state, you don't have anything. So this property of monad is being used to actually do some magic. Let's see. So imagine you have this plus three function and then you want to do a plus three on a value. So uh, traditionally you would pass an uh, integer to this plus three and then you get back a result five. But if, if this two is inside a monad box like this, you would do the other way around. You actually pass the function to it and then you let the function be applied on that value and put the value back in the box. So uh, for now, let's try to just understand monad with these uh, uh, pictures and then we'll jump into code uh, in the later part. So this is how you can achieve the same with optional, as simple as this. So when you do optional or top, you're actually putting the two inside the monad box. And then when you do a map and pass a plus three function to it, 
what you are essentially doing is this so you are trying to apply that function on the two and then the moment you do a dot get you get the result back you kind of taking value out of monad similarly if you have the monad in a stream uh, sorry uh, if you have some uh, values in stream you can do pretty much the same wherein you apply that function on each and every value as simple as that what if you don't have anything inside the monad what if the monad is in red state uh, nothing happens nothing really blows up uh, uh, just the function that you have passed it will be ignored and nothing really happens so in this particular example uh, imagine you have a monad empty uh, which means it's on the red state and then i do a map of plus 3 but this plus 3 is just ignored and then i do a or else or else is like a terminal operator just like the dot get we have seen before and then Uh, we are giving a value called zero. So what this essentially means is, if this is in the red state, this has empty value. Give me this default a zero, and I got back zero. So as simple as that. Uh, how can we use this particular property? So, so again, coming to the same functions, uh, even in maths, if we have multiple functions to be applied, we do this nested calling, right? F of g of h of x, it plus three plus two plus one of zero, and you get six. but then if you have it in the monad box you get this as simple as that you can simply apply functions one after the other in a linear fashion without nesting the calls but what benefit do you get out of it so the composition might look like this this is called functional composition by the way and as you can see in the right side box it's as if you're passing the box from one function to another what happens if the box turns red in between it just simply be ignored by the functions that are subsequently followed that particular function so imagine it turns right here and the next function would just be ignored and it won't be applied on it so that's fail fast for us which we going to make use of in our particular uh, particular implementation of solving a problem and then i'm going to take a moment and talk about monad composability uh, so there is a pre, uh, there is a notion that optional is introduced in java to kind of solve the null pointer problem but most of the time i see this in code wherein people kind of uh, misuse optional wherein they kind of get value out of it and then try to do something on it you got a line extra extra line unnecessarily you could have gone with null check if this is what you're doing doing a if is present check what you should be doing is this we should be like linearly applying uh, the operations on it without actually worrying whether the monad has a value or not we shouldn't be doing a is present check uh, unless it's really necessary so the moment you see something like this it's a code smell you should be doing this instead uh, this comes really handy when you have nested uh, if else checks so let's say you have a nested bean a bean inside a bean and then you wanted to null check uh the nested the bean inside it before you actually perform an operation on it you kind of have to do this and this kind of goes on if the nesting is more deeper but then with optional you can do it linearly so you can see right you are, we are breaking trees into linear paths so this is very very crucial uh, as we develop our uh, solution for our problem so and if said we kind of are and uh, kind of had our crash course on monads So the question is: Are monads used in enterprise software, or is just for fun? Okay, the answer can be so. Uh, it can be answered by the product that we have developed in Salesforce, and I'm not going to pitch about our product. Just I'm going to say about the design of a product, uh, requirements of a product, so that uh, the design that we're going to discuss later is going to make sense. Uh, by the way, a monad has a really cult following in our team, and uh, whenever someone says monad, this is how our team is react because they kind of. Uh, did a lot of brainstorming uh, during those days then we actually have to use uh, probably i'm the only guy who knows about this and uh, people were literally scared to actually write monads in our production code because we never know if we get stuck going forward so we kind of did a lot of brainstorming did a lot of uh, we kind of almost uh, hit each other <laughs> so in the end we went with this because uh, it kind of suited our uh, problem statement and then we really are enjoying it because even after 2 uh, years of it uh, the framework is never touched and we have been extending it for other services as well which we're going to see very shortly so we just have rest services uh, uh, we kind of we are a payments platform team and then we have services like a payment refund capture etc all those colloquial names uh, for now just to understand they are parallel services 
and um, what do you mean by parallel what do you mean by parallel services is this is uh, a payload for one of a service so a payload where you can understand a lot of things uh, just by looking at it there is nothing complex like uh, we take in the amount we take in all the payment method details account id etc so why is it parallel services is the payload looks almost similar for other services as well plus the thing is a payment method imagine this is a child object and this is used as is in other service like without any changes so if we have that requirement the other service guy doesn't want to write all the validations that are for this payment method so this is the guy that we want to validate and the requirement is we have to share all these validations so these are the kind of validations we kind of have can we we can have on this uh, particular beam for the sake of this talk i just kind of simplified uh, categorized them into three say simple data validations amount is all you need to do is it's not negative or some billion dollars right and a stateful validation is something that does a db operation and checks whether uh, a particular value is present so it's kind of also exception prone there are, there can be exceptions and then the nested validations uh, like we discussed a payment method is used as is in other services so all the validations for them should be hooked into the service without rewriting so and by the way these things come in batches uh, they're not one i just showed that in the picture as one but then we'll get a batch of these json objects so we're going to have to build a batch validation framework and for this particular talk again uh, let's not uh, kind of dive deep into this and replace our uh, bean with an egg so that it kind of is more relatable easy to understand so i'll be using egg to represent a bean and i'll be using a yolk to represent an nested object uh let me know if you have anybody has any confusion in between so uh, let me briefly talk about the framework requirements the batch validation framework that we're going to design now so the first one is configure the order of validations so we have seen certain number of validations kind of validations uh, that we have uh, before in the previous slide so the point is i have to i should be able to configure all my validations like cheapest first and costless later all the db related options i want to put at the back and then i have to cross share common and nested validations like the payment method one and then fail fast on each sub request we have a fail fast uh, requirement where we want to stop the moment we encounter a validation failure but then we also have a non fail fast in a different route i'll probably discuss that if we have time towards the end and partial failures is something when we get a batch of things we kind of have to pick those things which are failed in between and then uh only let those things which are valid so we're going to discuss more about that going forward like this partial failures is imagine the validation layer you have like two failures let us say and as you go to service layer uh, because of some xyz reasons you add a different failure and then the failures go on but you have to kind of carry those invalid ones along the valid ones till the last point and then only can give an aggregated response that's a challenge in batch right you can't try to give a error response for this invalid one in the validation layer itself so that's what i mean by partial failures and some meta requirements like we have a century of validations if the validations are just one of five it doesn't matter you can write them in any way but then we have got kind of some 100 validations across uh, these parallel services so it kind of gets tricky to kind of manage share and all that stuff and then unit testability is very important because validations would have so many corner cases and no compromise on performance great uh, like everything else in in world or software industry things are agile so requirements are never frozen so on the first day we just had one egg and one validation so things were very very simple we were so happy we were all partying but uh, then the pm comes in saying okay you have to deal with many eggs in one validation okay still not a problem i can just loop all those eggs uh, and just pass them into the validation simple but the moment uh, we got to this stage many eggs many validations that's when the temperature rose that's when the management problems kicked in where in uh, we got to manage all those uh, results of all the validations and then uh, kind of map all the failures to valid ones so let's see how that looks like in a code uh, i'm going to show a dummy code like i said uh, but most of it you can be able to relate uh, the, to the problem that we are solving so before getting into showing you the code uh, how the actual code that we have written in our first phase uh, following the uh, very popular imperative style in java 
first things first uh, let me talk about few operations that we do as a part of validations so uh, this is a simulation of the ones the type of validations that we have seen before imagine this is a simple operation that is done on a field like amount all you got to do is validate the data and uh, imagine this is this is a operation kind of does a db operation and throws an exception for some reason for some xyz reasons dbs are always unpredictable and uh, these all these operations imagine are not in our hands so we can't kind of clean code them so we have to accept them as is and then uh, and then we have another operation that works on a child like i've said yolk can be seen as a nested object inside egg so this guy only works on yolk and does throw some exceptions etc okay and then i'm going to show so this is imagine this is the this is how we going to deal with all this validations uh, orchestrating all those operations okay this is how it looks like so uh, all i'm trying to do is loop through all the eggs and i have my output would be like i need to uh, identify what eggs have failed and i don't care about bad eggs i want to know the reason why the eggs are bad so i my end list would have all the egg ids and all the reasons why they are bad so for that i am looping through all the eggs and then i'm performing an operation on each and every egg and based on the result they kind of give boolean results uh, i remove them from the iterator that's my fail fast way to do it and then i would put that in a map saying hey this egg failed and this is the id of the egg so the, in the end i would get the result set and it gets more funny when there are exceptions so you got to do a try catch and it's more fun when you have nested objects which have exceptions and it kind of overflows the screen as you can imagine so this is the classic pyramid problem if you have ever seen despite mocking code like this this is something we kind of see a lot in our production databases and instead of calling it complex uh, subjectively we just by looking at it let's do some metrics so uh, i am using a plugin called sonna cube i am using a gradle plugin which i can uh, so uh, this is the gradle plugin i just had in my gradle and then using this i can run a task called gradle sonna cube and with that i get results like this i kind of pre run them uh, to save some time and if you go inside this imperative uh, validation just a second i am kind of more focused on two complexity metrics uh, cyclomatic complexity and cognitive complexity so this particular code uh, again uh, this is only for the sake of uh, demo so i would request you to kind of magnify these numbers to what we do in production this is the amount of cognitive complexity this particular this is sick yep Uh, this particular uh, class file has so the cognitive complexity is measured based on uh, not based on number of branches uh, that cyclomatic complexity but uh, uh, the cognitive complexity goes a step further and kind of really sees into how difficult it is to read the code for a developer so to give an example a switch case the cyclomatic complexity would be number of cases but then cognitive complexity says it's just one so that's a better metric to uh, uh, to measure a complexity a readability complexity related complexity so this code of course is complex but then can we do better uh, can we kind of split this into multiple functions will that help let's see i kind of pre written some code so i kind of this code is splitting all those operations into individual functions don't get scared by the code right away i'm just going to expand one by one and show you what exactly is happening uh the simple this function validate one simple is doing the simple operation that we have seen before so kind of i split this i put this into a separate function this part in this and then going to the next function we do all the try catch in a different function okay great now does it help these functions are atomic i agree but then there is uh, a guy who orchestrates all these functions who is kind of a scary guy because uh, i call a function like this an octop octopus function because it does a lot of things first of all it is trying to call each and every validation and then get the result and then trying to 
check if I, he should proceed further or fail fast. And he's also maintaining a global state like bad egg failure bucket map or whatever, where he stores all the failures. Global uh, without immutability is a big uh, red flag whenever you see that on your code base because they are the point and source of bugs, all the bugs. And, and this, my biggest problem here is how can I change the va uh, validation order? Now we talked about configuring validation order. So now if I get more validations or if you wanna put one validation about the other, it's always a code change and code changes are scary. I have to change all the unit tests plus try doing it on Friday evening or something. It kind of, you never know, you can't go home happily because you don't know what you broke. So that, that's the problem of imperative uh, validations that we have seen the problem first, the problem statement. So time for some fun. This is what uh, we have ended up uh, a chaotic code. So imagine this is the kind of valid egg trying to escape all the validations. So this is how debugging a code looks like playing the hell level in Mario. So this is by the way, I loved enjoying play, playing this game as, as a child. I don't know if people are still playing this. So let's give a functional touch up to this problem. Uh, let's implement this, let's try to solve this using a pattern called chain of responsibility. This is a very popular pattern when it comes to validations. So the question is, is FP the best fit for that? So of course, this is a functional programming talk. What else do you expect me to say? If bring you till here and then say, I'm sorry, FP is not a bit best fit and oopsies, right? I know it's a bad joke and uh, uh, moving on. <laughs> so FP is uh, best fit because the reason is uh, every software problem can be seen in two ways, uh, wherein objects doing functions or functions doing objects. What I mean is in a particular case, we're not calling any functions on X, but X are being passed on to different functions one after the other. So it's uh, essentially processing processing the object in a chain of functions. So whenever you see such set of operations or transformations being done on certain state or a data, that's when you can kind of uh, identify that it can be elegantly solved with functional programming. That's the reason uh, SP is kind of popular when it comes to domains like big data, uh, machine learning, et cetera, because they have a lot of transformations. Great, so what did we do wrong before? We kind of, this is a 2D problem. If you see there are validations and an array of validations and there are eggs. And we kind of gave it an imp a one dimensional touch. Uh, we did not even see validations are values. Validations, uh, like we were treating them as functions and tried to orchestrate everything in the code, which kind of led to a lot of complexity. The moment you realize there are values too, it gives a different perspective to your problem. So, this is what we're going to do today. We're going to, we, are not, we have done imperative things, right? Now we're going to split this into three components, like validations, we're going to make them as separate functions. And then uh, uh, we will see how we can chain our validations one by one, which means uh, like we kind of chain them like uh, links of a chain. And then we orchestrate, we kind of also decide how this chain will be executed one after the other. So the moment we decouple these design parts into three separate things, it suddenly turns a lot of, uh, our validation engine turns extensible, which means I can add more validations without touching the other two, or I can configure, which means I can uh, shuffle the order, or I can kind of, uh, if I, let us say I have more dependencies like a graph algorithm, I can kind of come up with a linear thing. And then orchestration, uh, I don't have to depend on whether it's fail fast or error accumulation. What I mean is I have to, I want to know all the uh, validation errors of a particular object, let's say. So I don't have to worry about that. So this is how we're gonna split our uh, ma major components into three so that we kind of get an extensible framework. The first thing I do is make all the eggs immutable. This is very, very essential, especially when your state is passing through a lot of uh, functions, transformations, et cetera. How can you guarantee that none of those tinker your state? The only way is to make them immutable. This is not uh, necessary for our design, but this is something I would say as a functional programmer, uh, necessary wherever, uh, wherever you use immutability is gonna kind of uh, remove a lot of bugs and a lot of cognitive complexity, especially when you're trying to debug why this thing is uh, X, Y, Z at this particular place. You don't have to kind of go back and see who changed it. 
now how can you do that you can if you are using java kind of 8 or above it uh, there is or i don't know lumbo also supports a java 6 you will have a annotation called value which can kind of use it uh, i have used it this way so a value tag will make the things immutable uh, that gives all uh, private constructor sorry uh, getter setters no setters actually makes all your fields final etc so that's the easiest way or if you're uh, if you're kind of curious about the java 14 new uh, things like records records are like data classes in kotlin which kind of give you immutable objects out of the box so that's another good news for java developers that immutability is being put into the language itself great <clears throat> so what's the other different problem is we have heterogeneous data types in a pipeline what do you mean by that so you have valid 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 x and you have bad x as well but i don't care about bad x i care about why these eggs are bad and uh, i have validation failures for that so i have two different data types valid x and the validation failures but then java list prohibits having two different data types in the pipeline so for that we're going to put all our uh, all our uh, data types in a in a box called monad box of course that means uh, i'm going to show what exactly that means within a, in a second i uh, kind of show you in the code so this is the monad box that we're going to use for this particular presentation uh, just try to understand this monad box and then we'll jump into the code very very soon and this is coming from VAVR. Uh, this is an awesome functional programming library. I would recommend every Java developer to go and uh, explore this. And this either is in this class path. So what is an either monad? This is similar to what the maybe monad that we have seen before, but uh, with a slight difference. It has a left state and a right state. So we gonna it's it's called a sum type. So uh, when it comes to functional programming terms, this is just like enum. Enum, it can be either one or something else. I mean, it can be both. So similarly, other monad can either exist in left state or the right state, but not both. So we're going to use this property to put our validation failures in the left state and our uh, valid X on the right state. Great. So with this, uh, we're going to standardize our validations. I've said I'm going to show you what I mean by mm, uh, making all our functions flowing having monads flowing in them so this is how our previous simple validation looked like this is the simplest validation but it still got a complexity of two wherein this if and then a branch of implicit else we can turn that into this so this is pretty linear i'm going to explain jump into it in depth and explain what it is so all it's trying to do is take a valid egg and then perform some operations here the valid egg is an either how this is how this if you see in here this is of the type validator and this validator is the type alias that i have declared what i mean is uh, i just uh, added an interface in the code base you can go and refer it in the code base which kind of extends uh, a function from behavior library now this function is same as what a function that we get out of uh, java 8 or above wherein it has a generic which takes an input type and an output type. Now we're slightly jumping into advanced waters. So kind of if you, uh, if you kind of all lost, uh, you can uh, always refer back to this recording. But if you are, if you have already have good experience on these terms, you should be able to perfectly follow it. So we have a function which takes an input as either, and uh, it gives an output as either. How is that helping us? Uh, <clears throat> Uh, I have already shown you this code, which kind of turns our code into pretty lean. So I'm going back to the previous slide, wherein now you understand what are the input and output type. So this is a Lambda function in Java, which takes an input and then it expects the output of the same either monad. But then now I'm able to perf uh, perform operations on it without worrying whether the monad is on the left state or the right state, like the, uh, the red state or the blue state that we have seen before. And then in the end, all I do is, if this is in the red state because of the validation, I perform an operation, let's say, you can kind of uh, uh, compare both these. So <clears throat> I got the way, I, and the moment I do a filter and give an operation that kind of filters that monad into left or right state. Again, I'm not going in depth into those operations. You can refer them in the doc, 
But all you have to understand is if a simple operation gives me a false result, this monad is turned into left state. And then the get orals kicks in and then puts a validation failure into monad in that left state. So, and we have another, another kind of validators, uh, validators that we have seen before, which kind of throw exceptions, especially the ones like this, which have a lot of try catch uh, boilerplate code, because all we're doing in the end when we get an exception is take the error message out of it and uh, turning that to a validation failure and putting that in a box. And how this is done, can you can always refer back to the code and see it's very clear in the code, but just for now, focus on uh, the, uh, the upper part, just on the top level details, not go in depth. That can be changed into this. See all that uh, fluff about uh, try catch and all that boilerplate is gone. We can just write code like this without worrying whether it throws an exception or not. But how is this achieved? It can be done using this particular type of validation. Now we are treating valid, uh, functions as values, validations as values, right? As you can see, I'm just assigning a validation to a variable. That's how, that's what I mean by first, these are called first class functions, by the way, if you want to refer more about it. So how does this throwable validator look like? Let's go inside and see what the signature is. So uh, this is a checked function. Again, it's coming from VAVR. What, how is the difference between a checked function and a function? This guy explicitly throws an exception and you can't kind of, uh, uh, of course, function has a dot apply if you are aware in the uh, Java API. So this guy won't let you do a apply without doing a try catch. We'll see how we can make use of this in, in our code. So, so now we've seen two types of validators. One is validator, normal validator, another is throwable validator. So our first requirement, coming back to our requirements of framework, configure the order of validations. So we have seen two types, but the problem is how can you configure all these validations now, now that we have the validations as values, which are simply you put in a variable, right? So all you need is a ordered list to put these validations in, in order, one after the other, isn't it? So I'm gonna show how it looks like. So it all makes sense. So don't look at everything, just focus on this part. So all I'm trying to do is I'm trying to prepare a chain of all these validations. And if you call a chain, every link has to be of same type. Okay, uh, the list, first thing I want to do is I want to validate, uh, do the simple validation first, and then I, I want to jump onto a throwable validation. But we just saw this throwable operation is of type this. This is a different data type compared to this, right? I can't put two data types in a list. Uh, Java doesn't let me do that. For that, what I have to do is I have to do something called lifting. So you got a throwable operator and you throwable validator and you got to change that type to validator. This is called lifting in functional programming. I'm going to briefly touch upon how we are doing it here. But then if it doesn't make sense here, you can uh, happily I mean, uh, refer the code, it, uh, it kind of makes sense if you just spend a little time. So this is how our lift function looked like. Uh, let me, yep. <clears throat> yep. So what it does, what is lift? Uh, we are again going into some advanced concepts. So lift is nothing but, uh, it, it's, a, it's a higher order function. What it means is it takes in a function and gives out a function. If you just focus on input output type, it takes in a function of a type throwable validator and gives you back a validator here. So all it does is inside it kind of carefully executes that validator and turns that exception to either et cetera, et cetera. Let's not get into details here because it kind of gets a bit more complex. So that's how we are turning this uh, guy, this guy of into type, a validator type. And then you got validation, validate parent three, which is again of type validator, so we don't have problem. So that's how you can keep on adding more validations so that you will get a chain. But the thing is, this is only about parents. These are all validations on the egg type. If you see, all of them uh, work on the egg type. What about the validations that you have uh, on the nested, uh, on the yolk, yolk part, let's say nested validations that you've talked about before. So 
these are chain validation chain right you can as well make a chain of uh, chain validations with the same throwable etc but the problem is these are list of validators on yoke and these are list of validations on immutable like again these are two different types how can you again merge them into a single list same technique we can use something called lifting this lift looks a bit different than before which is this uh but again i don't want to get into details in the stock but uh, what this does is it takes again a chain function and uh, runs it on a executes that in the context of the parent so that it gets into the parent type i know this is this kind of is overwhelming in a talk but then uh, uh, i like i said i really want to introduce the concept so that you can go back and refer and understand more about it so this is essentially how it looks like a child validation is lifted to a parent validation so now what you got you turn all your throwable and uh, non throwable validators into validators and then you converted all your child validations into parent validator types now what you got is a nice little chain of all your validations so all the, this this is the entire chain of your validations and the best part is this is not in your actual code this is in the config so imagine this is in some spring config uh, or some somewhere uh, spring config can essentially be seen as some xml config if you are into older spring versions so this is not a code change the moment i have to introduce more validations or remove validations or shuffle them so this is totally agnostic of these validation functions that we are doing before right that that is the beauty of now we are uh, we have seen the second part of what we have seen before that in the three parts so why is this helpful uh, for when it comes to parallel services how can we actually make all this chain validation shareable so imagine you have a yolk and you have a chicken egg that uh, in which you want to run imagine chicken egg is like a service and then you want to uh, plug all the yolk related validations to the service so all you kind of lift them into chicken egg context okay and let's say you have a dino egg and you want you want to reuse all those yolk related validations you kind of go into kind of lifting all the yolk validations into dino egg so this, this is totally generic so that's the beauty of sharing so you can kind of lift them into whatever context you would like uh, you would want to because this code is totally generic if you see the lift code and all that these are all totally generic uh, you can, they can be found in uh, this package called Al algebra so this kind of a little complex in when it comes to especially java world where in the functional programming is just catching up but then when you go to scala or kotlin this is people kind of just exchange these terms uh, like normal normal terms so that's it fail fast on each sub request so we kind of uh, what we did is we kind of have all our validations we configured them now how can you run this chain run this chain of validations again is the list of eggs you have the 2d problem remember it's like you can you kind of get a nice matrix in the end at, uh, looking at what egg qualified what validation failure but then how can we do that how can we orchestrate that simple right all you need is a uh, uh, nested for loop now you have two lists you just have to apply one or the other so we kind of have a for loop here and a for loop here and you do blah 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 a lot of things in between but essentially the gist of it is you kind of apply a validation on an egg and check whether it's valid or not and you kind of get all the results but seeing this i we have built a very good infrastructure uh, and still sticking to our imperative habits all this nested for loops with all this mutation is not really necessary there is a more elegant way to be done in functional programming wherein i'm going to show something which is not so familiar in functional programming uh, world java world especially called for left so for left is something where if you're aggregating something aggregating a list of uh, while you're looping through a list of things you want to aggregate a result to it to uh, use a for left you also might have seen something called reduce in uh, functional in our java stream api and for left is like a mother of reduce so it's a special case of reduce reduce is a special case of for left by the way so uh, again i'm going to leave you with this pointer uh, i request you to go ahead and explore what the code is doing but essentially this does what this nested for loop does 
but why should i use it is it just because it's fancy the main advantages you will get is uh, first of all uh, this code the moment you understand what fold left is you don't have to kind of go sit understand what is in the for loop so no matter how many times you have seen this nested for loop it's always a new nested for loop so you kind of have to spend some energy into it but the moment you understand this it's that's it you see that and you know what's happening there and then you don't have to unit test this orchestration at all because the library developers are taking care of doing it for you and a lot of things are coming from java itself so uh, the moment you use them out of the box uh, totally a free kind of whatever you see on the screen is what going to happen if it compiles it runs that's the fun of functional programming and then it's a shared vocabulary of course uh, like within the team you can say to your peers or a code reviewer saying hey i just fold left it that and he understands it that's the beauty he doesn't have to spend time understanding what is in for loop plus this is uh, something like a universal vocabulary you would see the same in other languages like kotlin scala python whenever you see fold left you'll understand what's there so it's easy to comprehend other code bases as well so a lot of advantages and i would suggest you can kind of get away with uh, operations these dozen operators operations uh, in your day to day coding and uh, it can be more i'm just saying some initial way if you are kind of just getting your feet wet in these operations and as you go on as you keep using them they get really habituated as if uh, like your arithmetic plus minus operators and then you really get fluent with them and the best part they compress your code into beautiful expressions which talk to you uh rather than kind of losing themselves in the details and uh, this is just one way of doing it i have also other ways that i have put in the code i would request you to go and watch them and let us say of uh, i'm not i'm not a fan of let's say i i need error accumulation strategy which means we discussed i need all the errors so i can come up with a different strategy and none of the other two parts should uh, need to be touched like the configuration part or the validation part i can i can do this third part in a separate uh, separate kind of class way class or a utility function and this is totally generic if you see all these classes you don't see a egg anywhere uh, all of them are working on generics so you can essentially put this out as a library for your, your let's say you you have uh, different scrum teams working on different services you can put them out as a library and all this complexity if you feel this is complex this is all hidden it is all one time job and then you can your uh, consumers of your library can happily use it we have done that in our salesforce as well we have put all of this code into a library and uh, and the, whenever we get a new service a new scrum team starts up a new service they kind of happily use the api instead of kind of un- trying to understand the details they get all this design for free so it's almost like a eight point a story for free every sprint every uh, release or something for every new service <clears throat> so partial failures how can you uh, achieve uh, you you have seen those the, you remember that alien diagram and an aggregator response in a spaceship so how can we achieve that uh, i'm just going to touch upon without showing the code so imagine you have a bag of failures and uh, validation failures and valid eggs out of your validation layer so essentially you ha- you will have this um test so essentially this is just a test case uh, for you can as well go ahead and uh, kind of run them to check how these are things are working and you can put debug points so all i'm trying to do is i have a egg carton uh, and then i have i am getting a fail patch strategy what this does is uh, it kind of in the end chains all those functions all those validations and prepares a mega function for you so which you can just map on your list one after the other and then you collect back all the results so essentially you'll get a bag of aethers so if you see the type here of on my ide these are this is a chain of uh, just a bag of aethers so some can be on the left state some can be on the right state so the beauty is you can pass them as is to the next layer and the next layer kind of performs operations on them without really caring whether they are left or right because what happens is if they are on left state it is kind of ignored but how is that magic happening let's try to see what is underneath so i'm going into a map of the either the source code of the library either uh, or either if it's europe 
So uh, all it's uh, all it's trying to do is it's going to check the state of the monad. So if it's on the right state, great. Uh, the mapper function that you have passed will be applied on the either, right? Uh, if it's on the left state, nothing happens. You just get back the same red box or red box uh, alien in the red box back. So the the best part is we were handling all the ziffles before. Now, now that all of this is happening underneath, we can write happily these linear programs, so that we don't actually focus on uh, doing all the CFLs orchestration ourselves. That's the best part of using a monad. So, what about scalability? Okay, so you have done all this. So, imagine I kind of uh, want to do all of this in parallel. Now we have seen two kind of orchestrations, fail fast, error accumulation. I want to use something else which runs in parallel. How can I do that? Again, I don't have to touch anything. I'll, I can simply kind of, uh, I can write a function, simple function with, which actually checks the size of my, <clears throat> of my list that I'm kind of uh, looping through, let's say egg list. And we have seen how we can get a parallel stream and a stream core context philosophy that we have started with. And this guy doesn't have to know none of these uh, orchestration or the eggs have to know. And everything suddenly starts to run in parallel. I even have a test case here that you can go and uh, experiment with uh, here. So here I have, I have a function called get stream by size and it, all it does is it checks the size and I can pre-configure, let us say if it's about some 10,000, Hey, bring on the parallel stream. So none of these have to change and everything, all entire program suddenly runs in parallel. That's the beauty of having a context separated from core. Okay, great. And what about complexity? You have spoken a lot of things, but this talk is about complexity. So let's go and see what our complexity is. So the declarative. Uh, let me run this one more time. Something wrong with this. Uh, did it? <laughs> so uh, I'm trying to essentially run the Sona cube once again. This is how you can run. I kind of was, I was uh, experimenting with the record classes right before the stock and I kind of screwed up certain things. That can be the reason this uh, metrics might not be working as expected, but then I can uh, kind of provide you other, uh, uh, provide you a, mit a place wherein you can actually check those metrics. They would actually be one because uh, if you go to this, there is no branching at all. They would all should be, you should be able to see all of them as ones here. Let's try to reload. Let's pray that things are good. Railway validation too. They shouldn't get this. Anyways, let's try to just skip it. But for now, uh, you have to, all you have to understand is this uh, cyclomatic complexity is reduced to one. So that's kind of, uh, I, I wanna make a statement that after all this, SP is not complex. It fights cognitive complexity. So in the end, you would be able to write in, uh, linear code so that you kind of, as a developer, don't have to think about cognitive complexity. So we got minimum complexity with the same time complexity. That's the best part. And uh, if you're curious why I use railway oriented everywhere, this is called railway oriented programming. And this is also popularized by this guy called Scott Lashin. There's a great talk about it. You should go watch it. This is done in f -sharp, but of course, can be applied to Java as well. And finally, we turn our chaotic code into a linear imperative code, which is kind of uh, now just have to work on switching between two tracks left and right. So we got a clean code and a very uh, kind of clear code where we can, we don't have a lot of cognitive complexity. And this is a sli uh, source code links and you can find that on, them on GitHub. And if you like, please give a start to it. And I know I'm sounding like an Uber driver, but then those starts really matter. And this is a slide deck where you can go find those slides. 
And just want to end this talk with a simple statement called the bluff paradox. So what is it? Uh, it says that the most programmer who is the most powerful language only knows when to wield the power and when not to. Just because uh, functional programming is elegant doesn't mean we should use it everywhere. You should actually figure out where uh, it has to be used, where imperative can solve things in simpler ways. So the only way you can find that is to master both imperative and declarative coding style. So this, this diagram doesn't say function programming is uh, kind of superior to object oriented or something. All it says is uh, knowing functional programming along with OOPS makes you a better developer. So with that said, I would love to hear feedback from you. This is my personal email ID. And with that, we kind of won or borrow the complexity. I'm done. Thanks a lot for this opportunity. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Gopal. So uh, we have- I'll be happy uh, to take up questions. Yeah. Uh, I have a few questions uh, for you. Uh, let's see. Let me open the list. Uh, the first one, uh, are the slides and code available? Yes, uh, I've uh, given the slide where and it's available. I could also uh, give them to uh, Java Bin group so that I will also put that yeah. below the code description, the video description. So, yeah, perfect, perfect. Uh, there is one question uh, about what is your thoughts about Java's weaker type inference when you code in functional style? Doesn't the verbosity in Java make the code more difficult to read? That is exactly right. I agree totally. That's the reason I made type aliases, uh, if you have seen in our code, wherein uh, you would see a verbose function with a big input and output, which I kind of put in a different type alias. You can kind of get away, beat around the bush with that, but the problem stays. They kind of included VAR, VAR VAR uh, recently, but then it only partially solves the problem. I hope, we really hope as a Java community that Java uh, sees, uh, focuses more on the type inference like Kotlin does. Hmm. Thanks. Uh, one last question is, uh, to what extent do you use function, function composition and when should I use it? Yes, uh, good question. Like I've also answer, told in the talk, whenever you see a set of uh, uh, transformations being applied one after the other. And you don't want to deal with uh, all this if else. So a simple example can be optional wherein you don't want to check for nulls in each and every step. Uh, we also seen one example. So you just want to write linear code without focusing on which state that the monad or the stream is, uh, whether the stream is empty or stream even has any values in it. That's when you can use functional composition. That's the first thing I can say. But that's it, that's not the only place. Uh, functional composition, like we have seen before, actually gives a mental model out of, in, right on the canvas of your ID, wherein you can see uh, what's going on in the code rather than doing all that imperative statements. So, and then if you go into domain driven design and other things, uh, it gets more interesting wherein people say use cases, if you are aware of the clean architecture, Use case is a function. And uh, if you say, if you want to get a bigger use case, plumbing to other use cases, you can simply use your functional composition. So it kind of turns into a beautiful code. So it gets more interesting if you go to those areas. Uh, clean architecture is like born for functional program. They won't, they're both born for each other. You should really go and uh, explore that part as well. I would recommend that. Cool. Thank you, uh, Gopal. And uh, with that said, uh, today's session is over. I want to thank everyone who followed uh, our stream today. And uh, Gupal, thank you so much for contributing to Java Bin Online during these uh, thank you. Uh, times with the, the quarantine and so on. Uh, it was uh, great yes. to have you and uh, it was a very good walkthrough to complex uh, topics in functional programming world. Uh, so mm -hmm. thanks again and uh, thank you everyone and uh, see you uh, next week or tomorrow even when we have another meetup so 
Thank you and goodbye and good evening. Take care. Thanks and goodbye. Bye.